Pacific Gallery. She has that little spike at the end of her tail because she's small and a lot of animals could try and eat her. So she whips that spike out. It could really give them a good cut. Hence where they get the name Surgeon Fish. Now <laughs> <laughs> a big Queensland grouper coming by giving our, giving our diver a little high tail. That's going to be one of the biggest animals at the aquarium when it's fully grown. We're going to have our diver talk about it in just a bit. Oh, we have one of our stingers going by. Do you guys see the gills on the bottom? Those little things that are flapping, that is how sharks breathe. Even many of our fish, they have gills. So where our divers are currently diving, it is Palau. That is what this entire ecosystem is based off of. It's based off of a real spot in a real country in the far east side of our Pacific Ocean there. 
Now, Palau was one of the first countries to start protecting their oceans. In fact, they were the first place to create a shark protection zone. So they be kind of uh, became a model for the rest of the world here about how we should protect our animals here in the ocean. All right, so our diver just flashed me the OK sign. When divers are doing well, they give each other the OK sign, and you can make that too. You can wave to our divers, give them the OK. They can see you, we can see them. And you never want to give a thumbs up to a scuba diver, because then that means, hey, get out of the water. All right, good afternoon. Who are we talking with today? Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Andrew, and uh, I want to welcome you to the Aquarium of Pacific. If everybody can hear me OK, I want you to give me a nice big OK sign. Can you guys hear Andrew all right? There he goes, make that okay sign. Perfect. All right, Andrew, tell us about some of the animals in here. What's one of your favorite animals in our tropical Pacific Valley? Oh man, there's so many. I heard you talking earlier about just how diverse the coral reef ecosystem is, and it, and it uh, is very, very true. There's so many wonderful and fascinating animals that uh, inhabit this type of ecosystem. Uh, if I had to pick a favorite, you know, I should pick one that's close to me, right, so we can talk about it. Uh, this, the bonnethead sharks that are swimming by me here are really fascinating. It's really hard, though, not to uh, really enjoy the Queensland grouper, just because of the sheer size of how big it is uh, and how big it can become. And we're, uh, we can talk a little bit more about that, but as you can see, there's a lot of commotion going on inside the exhibit right now. And that's because this is uh, actually our, our feeding dive. There's so much happening, the turtle, I feel like we need to stop and talk I about know. the turtle. Everybody's out and about right now. So everybody, this is Theo. Theo the sea turtle, everyone say hi, Theo. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, if you saw another sea turtle earlier when you were walking through the tunnel, that is Theo's brother. His name is Lou. And they have a really interesting story. Yeah, they were uh, they were confiscated uh, as eggs at the border. Somebody was trying to uh, illegally transport them. And they were, uh, were taken and, and confiscated and donated to the aquarium so that uh, we could give them a home. Yeah, now they're growing nice and old with us. Theo and Lou have been with the aquarium since we opened our doors 20 years ago. So they're one of our charter animals, and we hope that they can be with us for our next 20th anniversary. Now you mentioned that this is a uh, you mentioned that this is a dive feed, right, Andrew? So how are you feeding the animals in here today? Yeah, so uh, we kind of need to get right into that because, as you can see, I have a, a team of divers sitting on the surface. Everybody has a different task and responsibility, and so I'm going to ask you all to help get this feed started. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a hand signal, okay? And you're gonna make uh, a circle with both of your hands just over your head like this, okay? On the count of three, you guys can help me. One, two, and three. We'll make a nice and big just like this. And this is gonna bring all of my dive team members down. And uh, like I said, they have different tasks and responsibilities. And you were mentioning, you kind of asked me, how do we feed the animals? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, how many people by a show of hands have a fish tank at home? Does anybody here have a fish tank at home? A couple people. How many people know somebody that has a fish tank? A couple more hands. So, uh, if you have a fish tank at home, you use a strategy to feed those animals with something called scatter feeding, where you simply sprinkle the food on the surface, all the animals that are hungry come up and eat. And in this exhibit, there's, uh, there's so many animals inside this exhibit that if we were to simply sprinkle the food on top, not everybody would get fed. So we have uh, my dive buddy in the back left corner here, just behind the stag horns. They're doing a scatter feed. So their responsibility is to distract all of the fast and aggressive animals over to that one side. And what that allows some of my other dive team members, like Matt here, who was feeding the rays, that allows them to come in and do what's called target feed, where they directly target a species, they're directly hand feeding that individual species, and we usually target, uh, target feed some of the animals that are a little bit slower, a little less aggressive, 
Uh, and that way we can ensure that everybody's getting fed. Exactly. So that scatter feeding on top really brings out those predatory hunting, foraging for food instincts, that, that drive, that competition. So scatter feeding is great for taking care of a lot of animals at once. Uh, but if we were to simply throw the food on top, just like Andrew was saying, some big animals like our stingrays and our sharks wouldn't really get a chance to eat. It. So when our divers show up at the same place, pretty much the same time, pretty much every day, then you can actually train these animals to show up in the same consistent spot for food. Now, so we have all that scatter feeding going on on the right hand side. We were pretty distracted over here watching the stingrays, and it was amazing watching them suction feed with that food right out of our divers hands. Now what are you all feeding the animals today? Yeah, so uh, we feed our animals uh, restaurant quality seafood or restaurant grade seafood. So all the same type of uh, quality of food that gets sent to the restaurants that some of you may consume is the same type of food that we get here. Uh, and the animals, depending on their diet, the husbandry staff or the people that are responsible for the health of these animals will be able to determine what kind of foods they should be feeding them. And it ranges from everything from uh, clams to mussels to different types of uh, fatty fish like capelin and herring. Uh, we also feed uh, mussels as enrichment to some of these animals. So it's a really wide range of, of different types of food. Exactly, it's a lot to juggle, a lot to accommodate. And thank goodness we have our divers here to help us with all of that. Uh, because our vet team is very, very small. Um, even though we have about 12,000 animals here. And we're so lucky to be able to have a small team because of our divers. They're doing a lot of the tasks that our animal caretakers are doing. They help clean the exhibits. They can look out for fish behavior. There's some fish they know by name. Um, and they also do a lot here to help clean and feed. So let's all give our divers a big round of applause. They're volunteers. All right, so we saw that uh, we have some, there's a diver going around here with some lettuce in his hand, feeding some of those herbivores. And now we have some carnivores that were being fed over here, those stingrays and those sharks. Can you tell us a little bit more about the sharks and stingrays we have in here? Yeah, we have uh, a couple different species of sharks. Uh, we have two species of sharks. Three if you count me with my hood. <laughs> uh, and we have uh, three species of rays. And the two species of sharks, you just saw one swim by the window here. That was our uh, zebra shark. And I, I believe I heard you talking a little bit before the show about uh, why we call them zebra sharks. You know, how they're, they're striped when they're young. And as they get older, those stripes kind of fan out and create this spotted pattern. Uh, so we have those. We also have uh, bonnet head sharks, which is a much smaller looking version of the hammerhead. And uh, here's one right on cue, right across the top of the window. These are fully grown. Uh, and I also heard you mention how most sharks in the world are actually very, very small. I think it's some like 50% of species of sharks don't grow to be more than five feet length or, or something like that. So very, very uh, small. Uh, species of uh, bonnethead that we have here. And for rays, uh, you saw two different rays on the window that were being fed. One was the uh, mangrove ray and the southern snake ray. And then of course you have our cow nose rays. And what I think is so cool that we should touch upon is that uh, rays and sharks are actually very closely related. And the way that they're uh, related is based on their skeletal structure, right? That's right. Yeah, so if you were to touch the tips of your nose, go ahead and touch the tip of your nose, and you touch the tips of your ears, do you feel that squishy stuff? That is called cartilage. And that's what these animal skeletons are made of. They don't have bones like you and I. And so they're made out of that cartilage. There's a lot of great reasons for why you want to have a body made of cartilage. It's very light. It's very buoyant. If you've ever gotten a piercing or you've ever uh, gotten a little cut on the tip of your nose, it heals very, very quickly. So being made of cartilage allows sharks and stingrays to have lots of different kinds of body shapes, but also so do having bones like many of the, the smaller, really colorful tropical fish in here. I just love watching all of them swim around. It's like a giant rainbow in here. Now we have those surgeon fish we were talking about, otherwise known as a lot of people call them dories, uh, and how they have those like, similar tails. Now, 
Can you tell us a little bit more about Golden Travales? Those guys have another cool way of defending themselves. There's some pretty amazing adaptations. Yeah, everybody, all the animals we're talking about are right on cue. Nice, and they, they, it's like they can hear us. I know, it's like they read the script. Yeah. So uh, we have the Travales. Uh, we have two different types of Travales in this exhibit. We have both golden and blue Travales in here. And the golden Travales and the blue Travales are the animals that I told you my diver, uh, my dive buddy was trying to distract over there. And you can actually see a lot of the golden Travales hanging out over there. There's one right here in front of the window. Uh, they have that yellow trim, silver body. And then uh, you can see they have these black bars that actually uh, go down the center of their of their body. And uh, when you watch them feed, it's actually really neat because uh, the majority of the time when they're feeding, those kind of lightish gray bars actually become very dark black, very, very prominent in color. And scientists believe that they use this as a form of communication amongst themselves as a way to indicate to each other that they found food. So uh, you'll see they, they do school together, especially during feeding time. They all kind of come together, and that's why we got to distract them over there. That's right. Having all of these colors, um, having a body made of bone versus cartilage, having different body shapes be nice and flat like a stingray, or slim and fast like a, like a blue palette tanger. Those are all called adaptations. Adaptations, they're body parts or behaviors that animals do or have that help them survive, and not only just survive, but really help them thrive out here. So by being able to change their colors, they can communicate with each other, and that's really cool. By having bright colors, they might say to another animal, hey, you might not want to eat me, I could be venomous. Uh, by having a nice flat body, they can squeeze their way into lots of cracks and crevices in the world. So the animals that live in coral reefs have so many amazing adaptations. We could go on for the rest of the day talking about them. But one of my favorite adaptations in the coral reef is the coral itself. It's an algae, it's an animal, it's kind of a rock. What's going on with the coral in here? Yeah, so uh, the, the coral in our exhibit, in this exhibit, is artificial, which means it's not real. And for a very good reason, uh, coral is uh, some of the slowest growing organisms on the planet. And what you see behind me here is representative of, you know, 100 or more years of coral growth. So if we were to actually remove this amount of coral from the ecosystem, we would uh, potentially devastate that entire ecosystem. And uh, coral is often thought, I think people are, a lot of people are confused. Some people think it's a plant, some people think it's a rock, some people know that it's an animal. Uh, but what's really fascinating about coral is that it's actually a relationship between two organisms. Uh, the actual coral polyps themselves, and then inside the coral polyp lives a, uh, what they call a dinoflagellate. It's a type of zoosin belly that actually has the ability to photosynthesize or extract sunlight to produce energy. And those two organisms, the coral polyp and the zoosin belly, actually really depend upon each other in what they call a symbiotic relationship, where both organisms are benefiting from that relationship. And it's a very delicate balance of water quality, sunlight, all these different things. And uh, unfortunately what happens is that an imbalance in those things causes uh, a break in this relationship and you get what's called coral bleaching. That's right. So the coral grows very, very slowly and it's still to out behind it. It wants to grow nice and high towards the surface. So that way the algae that lives inside of it can use the sun to make energy that's called photosynthesis. So you have a little algae that's living inside of this animal. And you can think of that coral polyp as basically a really tiny anemone, basically an upside down jellyfish. And this is interesting, coral bleaching can happen sometimes. So when our waters get too warm um, or the ocean conditions aren't great, the algae will leave that coral polyp. And now it's lost a major source of energy. Think of it like your phone at 100%, then you drop your phone and now it's at 1%. Your phone technically operating, but it's not going to go on for long. And that's what happens 
to the corals, unfortunately. So we didn't want to help devastate um, the ecosystems. We didn't want to participate in what's going on with the corals. In fact, we're actually growing and rehabilitating corals upstairs. We're doing a lot of breeding. Our divers went to Guam, uh, and we're going to be releasing some of that coral later on. So that's one way uh, at the aquarium that we're helping the coral. But what are some things that we could do, all of us here, what are some things we could do to help this coral stay around for many years to come? You know, something that I've been hearing a lot about in just the last like six or seven days is uh, people using uh, ocean safe sunscreen or like coral safe sunscreen uh, and it, uh, it really is important because our oceans are all interconnected and uh, a lot of people think that what you do here doesn't necessarily have an impact on the ecosystems that are, you know, thousands and thousands of miles away. And so, something I always uh, try to uh, encourage people to do is just be mindful of the things that you're flushing down your driveways, down your, your drains, uh, you know, trying to use uh, biodegradable products or environmentally friendly products, because all those things that end up in our waterways do end up uh, in the ocean and have an impact on things like temperature, uh, nutrient availability, water clarity, all those kinds of things. That's right. Anything that you can do to help minimize your energy, you say anything you can do to help uh, not use as much plastic or water, that's all going to do wonders for the coral here. Switching the coral safe sunscreen, that's a really easy change. You can do it like that. Say no to a straw. Next time you go out to eat, uh, could you have your AC before you leave so it doesn't turn on unnecessarily before you go out? These are all little changes. They take just a few seconds. But when we all do them together, no matter where we're from, we can have a huge impact on our ocean. And by coming to the aquarium today, you're already taking a great first step to learning more. So I want to thank you all for coming here today. It's our 20th anniversary this summer, so it's really exciting uh, to be here. There's lots of fun things going on. Let's give one more round of applause to our divers here. Donating their time and teaching us about the things they love. Now, Andrew, I have one last question for you. Do you and your team have time for any pictures? Yeah, absolutely. We'll, uh, we'll hang out for a couple minutes. All right, so. Kids down front. If you want to come say hi, come say hello. Yeah, feel free to come on up and say hi to our divers. My name is Alyssa. If you have any questions, I'm going to be sticking around for the next few minutes. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day here at the Aquarium Pacific. Okay.